Hello and welcome to that shooting show. My name's Steve Anderson. I am your humble host. Finally got back off the road after some extensive traveling and YouTubers can see we are back at home in the andersonshooting.com that shooting show Walter Firearms Studio. I uh, haven't even got the Walter signs unpacked yet, but until then you just have to look at my hat. Go ahead and look at it, Walter. And of course, they are the only company that I'm aware of that's going to give you a 30-day money-back guarantee on your PDP or any other Walther uh, competition-appropriate pistol you can get your grubby little mitts on. You ain't going to need that 30-day money-back guarantee, but it is there if you want it. And also, Targets USA, as you know, manufactures the finest steel to have, hmm, hmm, the finest gun handling gadgetry you can wrap around your waist or anywhere else. It is steel. Yeah, the finest steel targetry you can wrap around your waist or any... That's not right either. The finest steel targetry on the planet. It is portable. It is affordable. It is the very best. Hunter's HD Gold, as you know, is the only eyewear that I wear, and I are wearing it right now. The AMG-Lab.com Command and Timer continues to turn heads and blow minds by putting that their time into that their tablet. Uh, it does some other tricks. That's my favorite one. I'm sorry about the lead time. Can't do anything about it. All I know is you will eventually get your timer, and it will be the best timer you have ever used, and you will have the best time with the best timer. OutdoorDynamics.net, as you know, remanufactures the finest competition ammunition you can dispense from a Freedom Seed dispenser. And, of course, Shooting Sports Innovations is a lot to type because there's a lot to see. And now I know why I made the CR Speed error because they're normally second. And I wrote them down last. So CR Speed, the finest gun handling gadgetry on the planet. Want to let you know we have a couple of spots available in Port Townsend, Washington, April 4, 5, and 6. We're going to be doing two-day class and match mode coaching there. Uh, a couple spots available for that. You can always go to upcoming classes at andersonshooting.com and see where we're going to be and what we're going to be doing. And you can always get a free class if you can find a range in your area that is appropriate for the pistol classes that we do uh, you can get the class for free you don't have to pay the range fees if there are any we can work on that we can accommodate those somehow all you got to do is make the connection with the range and help me secure the date and you can get the class for free and if you want to you can have the joy of having me stay in your home or you can pick my brain to whatever extent you want to so those are your options. Just send me an email and say, hey, I want a free class. Steve at AndersonShooting.com. Also want to remind you, we're going to be in South Africa in the month of May. And Shanae has asked me to remind international travelers that South Africa is not a vast wasteland of terror. <laughs> it's just not. Um, I was a little apprehensive when I went there the first time because I am a typical ignorant American. And I didn't know what to expect. She assured me that I wouldn't be uh, put on, what's the thing called, the little spit thing? She assured me that I wouldn't be eaten like a pig uh, after being roasted by the villagers. None of that has ever happened. You know, and my experience in South Africa has been perfectly safe. Um, have not had any safety issues of any kind. Uh, electricity is rock solid reliable at least 20 hours a day. But seriously, if you're considering going to South Africa from a neighboring country, you do not be, need to be afraid to go there. Okay, It is a perfectly safe place to be. The range is beautiful, and everything about that country that I've ever been exposed to is awesome. And if you don't believe me, come over to South Africa in May. Get yourself some biltong. Pre prepare to be addicted. Go to a braai, but be prepared to eat sometime after midnight. See, the South African braai, B-R-A-A-I, I believe, is a social event where they show up about 6, 30, 7 o'clock. And I only eat once a day, so I'm ready to eat the tablecloth by this point. But they show up about 6, 7 o'clock, and they serve some drinks and people chat. And then about 8 o'clock, somebody lights a wooden fire, and something has to happen to the wood and the embers uh, that apparently takes four hours. And then about 1130, we start thinking about eating, finally eat about midnight, at which point I am about to consume my own appendages. I'm so hungry. Uh, but it's well worth it because the South African braai features the braai broiki, 
And if you're if you're interested in coming to South Africa, do it just for that. The only thing I'll say for you Americans is it is the world's greatest grilled cheese sandwich, and that doesn't even do it justice. Just imagine the world's greatest grilled cheese sandwich with proprietary ingredients, a little bit of onion, a little bit of tomato, something in the mayonnaise family, and probably some chutney. Um, I like them a little bit better if some bacon falls on there or some other meat, but I'm just as happy to eat them uh, like they are. And it is a wonderful experience. And anybody coming over to South Africa from some neighboring country, if you let me or Shanae know you're coming, we'll make sure that you get to a braai. We'll also make sure you don't become the braai. But no, you you don't need to worry about it. It's perfectly safe. All right. So today we're going to do some case studies. Oh, I think we covered everything. Oh, yeah. Uh, we do have some mental management in unusual times, I try to do mental management during the week as early as possible. But in the month of March, we've got uh, Saturday the 23rd from noon to 4, followed by Sunday the 24th from noon to 2. Um, there's, I know there's still some spots there for online mental management. And then the most popular time slot, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, March 26, 27, and 28. It's a six-hour class broken into three chunks. For the PM sessions on the 23rd and 24th, we're going to do four hours on Saturday and two hours on Sunday. If you come take this course and if you internalize the information in there and you trust me on that, then you will be just like some of the shooters I'm getting ready to tell you about. So we're going to do some mental management case studies. Okay. And I got a lot of trophies in the mail today, so we're going to talk about those. All right, so the first one says it's a lovely picture of just a ton of hardware. I mean, this is more hardware than Mr. T used to wear. You young people have to Google Mr. T. This guy's got more hardware than that guy. And he says this was the outcome of the Level 3 Nationals in Cape Town over the weekend. This is my third national title and fifth president. Hmm. It's my third national title and fifth president's medal in Ipsic in three years. Thanks for the assistance. I would like to organize another call in next week somewhere if that is okay. I'll respond to him right now. But it, it, uh, we have to use WhatsApp in South Africa. Sure. Let me just finish that up right quick. I'll let you know what is available. Okay. So there's our first case study. Had that guy in a couple of technical classes, had that guy in mental management, and you saw the result. The other one is also from South Africa. And this is a guy whose name rhymes with Charles. Because I know he doesn't, he doesn't mind if I give his name. Hey, Steve, hope you're having a lack of time in Wyoming. As you know, we recently had our first national match for the year, and I changed over to Classic or Single Stack in USPSA. This was my first major match after taking your advanced class. That's how they speak in South Africa. Advanced class. We'd say advanced class. They say advanced class. And mental management last time you were here in South Africa. I was a bit nervous about changing over to a new division and didn't know what to expect in terms of results. Okay. If we don't know what to expect in terms of results, that means we can pre-accept them using one of four levels. I don't care. It is what it is. I'll do well or I'm likely to win. The one in four can't be faked. You can't go to an important competition and tell yourself you don't care. You also can't go to a competition and tell yourself you're going to win if you don't believe it. But many of you listening to this program know that feeling. You might remember the first time you got it. You might have gone to a local match or maybe a regional match or maybe a national match and known you were going to win. That feeling cannot be faked. So please don't try to fake it if it's not real. If you're almost there, then you're going to want to talk about, I'll do well. And you want to follow that up with a process within your control. And we have that. So I decided to go to the match. He probably says match with two goals. Memorize every stage plan and put the sights in the middle of the target. I knew I could do that for 23 stages over three days. I just did that and it went great. I made some mistakes on some stages. That's going to happen. 
But I'm very proud of my mental process, enabling me to emotionally correct those mistakes while shooting and not carry those mistakes over to the next stage. I was able to let them go and just focus on what was up next for me to do. I shot very consistently over the course of the three days. During with some challenging external factors like heat, wind, and dust. I think my process allowed me to tune out all that noise and just focus on stuff within my control. Ended up 10th place in my division and shooting 80.45% of the winner. And my 1911 functioned flawlessly, not a single malfunction. That's pretty good for an antique firearm. Charles is, is one of my favorite shooters to work with um, because... He's really interested in controlling things within his control. He doesn't beat himself up over a training schedule that may not be as rigorous as some others because that's a choice he's made. He's got a new baby and may not be willing or able, which is fine, to train a lot. But when you have a strong mental process, the quality of your training is so much improved. So the thing about training is if you're doing it incorrectly, the more you do, the more it hurts you. And what I principally mean there is if you're training and you're receiving negative imprints to your self-image, you are doing more harm than good to your shooting. And you type A guys, you don't believe me. And that's okay. You just keep doing what you're doing and stay in the middle of the pack. But when you start training with intensity and acquiring positive imprints, well, you're just telling me to ignore my mistakes. That's not what I'm telling you to do there, partner. What I'm telling you to do is acknowledge that you are fixing your mistakes. What I'm telling you to do is acknowledge that you are improving. Acknowledge that you are providing solutions for the problems, not just going out and saying, yep, still suck at this, still suck at that, still suck over here, and still suck over there. Make your own jokes if you want to. But two of the biggest problems in the sport are negative imprints during training and the conscious control of speed. You make those two mistakes at the same time, And you are in mid-packville, setting up shop, signing a lease, looking for property to rent or buy. I'd recommend you rent it because I can move you out of there. Okay. So there's my first two cases. Both of them understanding that a process-based performance with a healthy self-image is going to get them what I want. Get them, well, get them what I want, get them what they want get them what we want. We'll all get what we want. And then I got another one from a guy who was interested in making B-class. He's going to an all-classifier match. I made it to B-class. I was at 80 to 85% of mental management game, and I feel like I performed at that level. Happy to have made the progress. Thank you for your coaching. We had a call with this guy on the cusp of B-class. Wanting to get in there. So we, again, we identify an objective within our control that we believe we can do. And I'm going to give you another case study out of order. I'm going to give you a case study called Lanny Basham. L-A-N-N-Y-B-A-S-S-H-A-M in 1972. He goes to the Olympics with an objective. Hey, Lanny, what do you got to do today? Oh, that's easy. I got to beat a guy I've never beat and win the Olympics. Do you know how to do that? Nope, I've got no idea. So 1972, we have a results-based objective that we don't believe we can do. We don't even know how to do it, but we're still going to try it. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it, but we're still going to try it. And the result is an overtry and a choke. Anytime you have a results-based goal you don't believe you can do, overtrying is in your future. So he comes back. Starts talking to gold medalists about the mental game, and he he doesn't really invent mental management so much as identifies what the winners are doing. Because in 1972, a lot of these gold medalists didn't know what they were doing to have a good mental game. They were what we call unconscious competent. I'm doing something, but I don't really know what it is. So he learns as much as he can learn about what they think they're doing. He winds up with three stacks of index cards on his desk. You may know what they are. You may need to come to class to find out what they are. But I don't believe he invented mental management. I believe he codified it based on what gold medalists were doing without even being aware of it. Okay? 1976, he goes back and says, hey, Lanny, what do you got to do today? Well, that's easy. I got to run my mental program on every shot. 
Do you know how to do that? I'm the best in the world. So 1972, results-based objective we don't know how to do, don't believe we can do. 1976, process-based objective that we believe we're the best in the world at. And I don't know if Lanny believed he was the best shooter in 1976, but I do know he believed he was the best competitor. And you know if there's two shooters of similar skill, it ain't going to be the best shooter that wins. It's going to be the best competitor. And if you accumulate negative imprints in training and you're consciously controlling your speed, you will never be the best competitor outside of your small little pond. And those of you that are doing that, negative imprints during training, conscious control of speed, you're like the functional alcoholic who's having just enough success to keep from changing his ways. But real success is eluding you because of negative imprints during training and the conscious control of speed. Okay, now the next one I want to tell you about is a guy I've been working with for a while who may have believed he could outsmart mental management in the beginning. That's very common. So let's just see what he says. Got to find his message here. Uh, oh, it should be right here. There we go. Hey, I made master last Saturday. You are a big part of that, bud. And I said, awesome news, man who will remain anonymous. So this gentleman was, is extremely type A, and he's very much a realist. So optimistic thoughts when things are not going well are very counterintuitive for him. And so we got to change how we frame that. If somebody's type A, if they're a super realist and they're struggling, they are not going to believe they are getting anything right. But what they can do is believe they know how to get it right. Even if we're not getting it every time the timer goes off. And this is a big part of the journal. And we'll kind of come back to that on the next case study. Right? Most shooters know more about their failures than they do their success. Hell, in that category, many of them don't even see successes. I cannot tell you how many high-level shooters I've worked with that didn't tell me they were high-level after until after they told me all the things they can't do. Well, I'm having trouble over here, having trouble over there. And then somebody points out, oh, by the way, the guy saying that is a multi-time national champion and holds two world records. Well, he sure knows a lot about what he can't do for a guy that's doing that or has done that. Which brings us to our next case study. This young man has been on a phenomenal winning streak until very lately. And now he's in a little bit of a slump. And I just joined the ranks of Lanny Basham again, which is pretty cool. I said, okay, he's telling me all these things he can't do. Can't do this, can't do that, can't do this over here, can't do that over there. I said, okay, let's go in your journal and let's read about your best or favorite match and let's see if you learn something or if you were doing something well that's not happening anymore and the reason i joined the ranks of lanny basham is the last journal entry he had done was his last great match or so he believes so that means between his last great month his last great match Throughout this little bit of a slump he's enduring, he doesn't know what he's learning, and he doesn't know what he's doing well. And buddy, if you're listening, I told you the same thing when I was on the phone with you. So I'm not talking out of school here. I'm talking out of turn, telling tales out of school. I don't know. I'm not telling you anything I wouldn't say to your face. But you used to know what it looked like and felt like to get it right. And you have forgotten that. You have forgotten the mindset in which you got it right. And the reason that happens is when an athlete is doing well, when it is normal. Doing well is normal. So self-image provides more of that skill. Okay, Self-image is always going to be a filter for subconscious skill. So if you're not getting the skill you know you have when the timer goes off, that is 100% a self-image problem. Now, if you don't have the skill, we can help that too. But most people that come to see me for mental game advice have plenty of skill, and skill is not the problem. But this guy, he's forgotten what it looks like and feels like to get it right. 
and he's moved up the ranks very, very quickly in the last six months. But he's come to a bit of a plateau. Well, there may be technical things he needs to do to get out of that plateau, but as we're talking to him, he, he's in this boat where many, many of you are, where he's two to three seconds off the pace on most large stages. And that's a frustrating place to be. It makes it very tempting to rush, try a hurry to try to find those two to three seconds. But in talking to him about it, the mental errors that he's making while he's doing this are costing him at least half of that time. And what I mean by that is, if there's a technical reason he's 1.5 off the pace, there's a mental reason adding another 1.5. And what I told him is, until you go out and learn to produce a winning performance under pressure on demand, we won't know what to work on. Because we have too many, too many mental mistakes clouding the data. Well, here I was off the pace three seconds, but I had a mic and I had to go back and correct it. Well, that's probably two seconds, depending on how much you, you left, you know, how far away you were from the target engagement area, which means you're really only a second off the pace without the mental error. But my point is we need to eliminate the mental errors or reduce them dramatically before we can go working on technical stuff. Okay. I'm also working tonight. I have my second class with a very high level household name PRS rifle team. And I am really enjoying working with my PRS shooters. I'm having such a blast working with these guys because I'm learning more about their sport. And I'm also learning that most shooters have the same problem. And the problem is they know more about their perceived failures than their success. I was talking to one of the guys on one of these teams, and I had no idea who he was because I don't, I don't follow PRS nationally right now. I don't know who the big names are and who they aren't, okay? But this guy is telling me all these things that he can't do, all these reasons that he's lost matches, and all of the things that he thinks is wrong with his current shooting skill, and then somebody else had to point out that he's a three-time national champion and I believe a one-time world champion. And I am not aware of another sport in which world champions broadcast the things they can't do. Now, I don't follow a lot of sports. But in the interviews that I see with champions, I don't hear them talking about what they did wrong. Now, maybe they do away from the camera. I would assume they probably do. But guys, when you're getting what you want, you have to know what you're doing. And if you're not getting what you want, you simply have to go back to what was working. But if you don't have it written down in a way you can understand it and repeat it, how are you going to get back? If you don't write a book about your best shooting and how to duplicate it, when you slip away from that, how are you going to know how to get it back? Well, I'm not going to forget. Okay, well, keep, maybe. Maybe. What I'm saying is, without a consistent mental performance, there's nothing technical that can be done. I mean, you could, but chances are you're not going to get access to it anyway, and chances are, so let, let's say we do get faster and more accurate, but we're still making technical mistakes. How are we going to know? All right, I talked to another PRS shooter on the phone today. He said, the best match I ever had, well... I don't know if it was the best. He goes, my best, most recent match, I performed extremely well. And the only reason I didn't win was because of equipment problems. I said, okay, let's do a couple of things. Let's identify what we were doing to have our best performance we can remember. And let's solve the equipment problems. That's a guy who's getting ready to win. Okay. My silhouette shooters in Wyoming. What a great group of dudes. The interesting thing about self-image in that environment was virtually every performance prediction came true. The guys that, well, the shooters that knew they were going to struggle on the chickens. So just imagine shooting a steel chicken the size of a golf ball at 50 yards uh, unsupported with an eight power scope that only has crosshairs. No other hash marks that I'm aware of, not the ones I saw. Yep, I always shoot four or five. Never hit six. That was the prediction, and that was what happened. 
I always clean everything, and then I have trouble on the chickens. That was also the prediction, and that also happened. One shooter was struggling with consistency, and then all of a sudden, she cleaned the pigs. Hey, what are you doing different? I always clean the pigs. Now, you can't go from, I always clean the pigs, or I always clean the stage, to I always clean the chickens, or I always ace the steel and I always have trouble on the no-shoots. You can't get there in one day. But if you're solving the problem technically and you don't acknowledge that you're solving the problem, the problem remains unsolved. Because your self-image, what you believe about your shooting, is what's going to happen when the timer goes off. Remember 1976, all I got to do is run my mental program. That's what Lanny Basham said. Can you do that? I'm the best in the world. So all of your opinions about your shooting, guys, they go into your ammo bag and they get loaded in the gun. And they come out of the end of that gun. Well, you're telling me to tell myself I'm the best. I'm telling you to, I'm telling you to tell yourself you're greater improving at every skill in the sport. If, if you want access to your training, if you don't want access to your training, then you just do whatever you want. I'm just telling you that the opinion you have about the training you're doing may be more important than the training you're doing. And if you don't believe me, just look at your own career. You'll see evidence of it. The skills you've improved that you know you've improved. Hey, I've been working on movement and it's getting better. And this stage right here is a great opportunity to do that. It's going to go pretty well. Or, here's more partials, I suck at those, this is going to be an excrement presentation. El Fierro de Dumpstero. Okay? But going back to my silhouette shooters, the vast majority of, of the predictions they had about their shooting came true. Had one guy shoot a personal best, as we talked about, had another shooter do extremely well, and my favorite part of that whole event were the people that I thought were skeptical attacking the journal when they got done. Just attacking it. Because anytime you learn something that contributes to your success, you need to write it down so you don't forget it. Iron sight shooters, how many times have you had to learn that a poor sight picture produces a poor shot? Most iron sight shooters will say, I have to learn that every time I go to the range. Why? Why do we have to learn that every time we go to the range? Isn't that enough of a firearms fact to be learned once? Now, that may not be the most important thing in training all the time, but if we're looking for accuracy and or we're shooting for score, if I'm an iron sight shooter and I don't know that a poor sight picture produces a poor shot, what am I doing? What good does it do me to train any other skills if I don't know that? Well, most of them do know that on some level. But because of a poor self-image, they're afraid of being slow. And that causes them to pull the trigger before they have an acceptable sight picture. What do we think is going to happen? Hey, my targets are over there. My sights are over there. I'm feeling under time pressure. I'm just going to go ahead and touch one off and see what happens. Hmm, dearie me, I appear to have missed a target with a poor sight picture again. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back and practice. And I'm going to tell myself I'm too slow the entire time. So that the next time I go to the match and I'm waiting for an acceptable sight picture, I'm going to be reminded that I'm too slow. Therefore, I'm going to lob one off again and express shock and awe that it did not strike its intended target. What did we think was going to happen? This isn't meant to be a tough love show. This is meant to be a journals of experience show. Um, but I, I made little notes here. And the success or struggle of everybody on my list can be attributed to self-image. I'm getting better at the chickens. I'm getting better at one-handed shooting. I'm extremely good at putting my sights in the middle of the target. Okay, these ideas, these opinions go with you to the match. And no, I'm not telling you to lie to yourself. I'm not. You know, Lanny says expecting to win, expecting to do well doesn't always work. But expecting to lose and expecting to struggle works 100% of the time. 
one of the guys on the teams I'm coaching right now, uh, I'm not going to say he was a, a skeptic, but the reality is if somebody has had high success without using mental management specifically, they have every right to be skeptical because they're doing something different or they think they are. But I'll tell you this, anybody who's having a high level of success is using mental management without realizing it. That's what I'll tell you. Because they have strategy, they have skill, and they have confidence. And maybe those elements aren't uh, present in the correct proportion, but they have some level of strategy, they have a very high level of skill, and something, when they're winning, is giving them confidence. And that's mental management. You can have all the strategy in the world and all the confidence in the world. Without skill, it ain't going nowhere. You can have all the skill and all the confidence. Without strategy, it ain't going nowhere. And the one people don't believe me on is if you have all, um, we may have already mentioned this one. I tried to do them backwards. You can have all the strategy and all the skill, but if you don't have confidence, you are going nowhere. But when you have strategy, skill, and confidence in the right proportion at the right time and you can control what you're thinking about and you believe you're going to be successful, you're not worried about the results, and you do have a level of skill appropriate for the task, you are going to be successful. I think the skeptics think that we're saying I can just sit here and visualize doing well in PRS or doing well in silhouette shooting. Well, actually, I can do that. And once I start learning some technical skills, that's going to put me a lot closer. But here's the deal. If I'm, doing, if I'm working on the technical skills and I don't sit here and visualize knocking them over, cleaning the stage, I may be wasting my time training. Maybe. Okay? All right, that's going to do it for today. Um, I, th- I believe this uh, dead horse has been beaten sufficiently with a broken record. Um, I just want to tell you, If you have got the skill to reach your goals and you're not reaching your goals, I need you to reach out to me because I can help you. You may not like the solution. In fact, the solution at first will be very uncomfortable. But I've just gave you some case studies of where people are doing it and they're getting it right. People are deviating and they're struggling a little bit. We have a mixed bag on the teams. Oh, that's what I was going to tell you. One guy, I got off on the skeptic train there. Um, it's not the septic train. Well, <laughs> I suppose, I suppose if you're on the skeptic train, you're probably headed for the septic train. <laughs> oh my goodness. That was a good one. So this guy said, after the first class, I examined all of my attitudes toward the sport. And they were all negative. I'm not good at this. I don't have time for that. I'm having trouble over here. And I'm having trouble over there. Those ideas will choke off any skill that you have. So let's fix them technically. But let's also fix them mentally. So we can get access to them under pressure on demand. All right, folks. Hope you've enjoyed today's program. Uh, We are off to Kentucky tomorrow to see one of my favorite human beings uh, for some Steel Challenge match mode coaching. Um, And what I can only imagine will be a dad joke competition of epic proportions. Um, If I'm a master dad joker, he's a a distinguished master. Um, If I'm a GM in dad jokes, I'm a paper GM and he's the real G. So we'll be laughing ourselves silly over dad jokes and puns. Looking very much forward to that. And until we meet again on the range, on the Zoom, any or anywhere else, be like me, do what I do, say it with me. One, two, three, get to work. Oh, and go check out AndersonShooting.com upcoming classes. Let's get you to your potential.